Okay, in the name of God, the compassionate, and the merciful, hello everyone and welcome to the new episode of the Fact Series in which we discuss international political matters every week. This is Fuad Mahdavi and in this episode I have the honor of being the host of Robert Bridge, an American journalist and author. We are here to discuss the diminishing of the role of the United States in the international arena. Thank you for joining us, Robert, and good to be with you. Thank you for having me today, Bob. You're welcome. Uh, you know, one of the significant branches in the interaction with the countries of the world is the economic dimension. As you know, the international economy has witnessed astonishing changes in the last two decades and noticeable changes in the position and extent of the influence of economic powers and the emergence of new economic vigor have affected the international system. Now, with the crisis in the United States, this is even more apparent. I would like to have your uh, precious words on this issue. Go ahead. Well, that's a, that's a rather loaded question, Fawad. Um As far as where it's going right now with the, the crisis, with the COVID and everything, and with Donald Trump in charge, uh, things have really turned on their head. Uh, there has been, over, as you have mentioned, over the last few years, there has been a, a change in the economic climate, uh, especially since Trump took office. It's, it's been a complete turnaround, and the United States right now, they're, they're pushing the whole idea, the whole notion that, America, as you know, America first, make America great again. And so basically what we see is this return to a sort of a nationalistic attitude in the, in the United States. Which, uh, which is, could, it could be considered to be dangerous for the world. Um, it's certainly, uh, it's thrown, it's, th it's thrown the, actually for the United States, it's basically thrown us into somewhat of a civil war inside of the country. It's caused a great uh, domestic crisis. Um, the things that, for example, Barack Obama had been pushing, they were really pushing for ex it's, it exporting a lot of our economy outside of the country to China, many other places. Now you have Donald Trump who wants to come in and turn everything around. So it's just the whole world right now, it's topsy-turvy in terms of uh, uh, how that's going. So it, it remains to be seen how that's going to work out. Okay, great. Uh, you know, the decline of the Western liberal order is a fact that is taking place in the international system and the United States as a leader of this order has itself weakened and the components of its economic power are not in a favorable position actually. Is this a, a process that threatens American hegemony and domination? Uh, the Western World Order, well, it's, it's a big topic, and there are many, many aspects of it. Uh, myself, as an American, I look at it, and I see things that are happening that have happened within the past just 10 years that I never could have dreamed of. And you have things like, for example, multiculturalism, um, where the, the belief that diversity is, is the greatest good. And, you know, since 1965, basically, and uh, they've opened up the doors to America. I mean, America's doors have always been open, but there, before 1965, there were restrictions basically on who could come in. They had, uh, they really vetted people in terms of who was coming in. You know, they wanted, they wanted people with a good education, uh, with, they wanted people who could help, help America to become a stronger country. After 1965, with the Im uh, National Immigration Act, they basically just open the doors to everybody and it doesn't you know it, it doesn't matter if these people are black white yellow whoever the, the important thing i believe is that they have something that they can offer to the united states and but what happened was they just let people in who didn't who weren't able to contribute so that's one aspect of the problem um is multiculturalism. There's nothing wrong, I believe, with multiculturalism. Many countries, as your country is multicultural. Um, Russia, where I'm living right now, it's very multicultural. We have one, like, for example, in Moscow, we have one of the biggest, I think it is the biggest mosque in all of Europe, right in the center of Moscow. We have the biggest synagogue, for example, in Moscow. So it's a very multicultural um, 
multi-dimensional place uh, different religions here and everything it's 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 something actually that really surprises people when they hear about russia but speaking about the united states you have this other aspect um this hyper liberalism that's infected the western world uh and it's i believe started in the united states of course it seems like all the trends start there and namely for me the most disturbing thing is for example this transgender movement um so you have things like this and not that i have any myself personally i think you know if people want to live a certain way it's okay but what they're doing in the united states for example in in the west and in germany uh they're pushing this ideology this uh sexual ideology on children you know so you have and i i would never send my child for example to to the the west or western school right now the way it is it's just it's a complete nightmare really you have no idea what they're going to put into into the children's minds they're not there to learn the three r's the basics reading writing and arithmetic they're being taught things that yes there is a place for perhaps discussions on okay sexual relations but let's let's save that for later right when when a kid is 16 years old for example why are they talking about these things at the age of 3 or not the age of 3 but in the grade 3 for example so in russia um i i compare things a lot with russia i came here and this is one thing that i have you know i have children and it's one thing i know that and perhaps in your country as well i know that would never fly here you would never have teachers feeling the need to talk to kids about uh you know how there are 74 different genders <laughs> for example i these things just would would not happen in russia and i i uh i thank god that i found a place like this where I, because when i moved here i had no idea the changes that would take place in my country and now that i'm here i i realized that in hindsight i had made the right decision to move east where things are still you know normal i hope i don't know how long it's going to stay this way because you can see this this movement and it's a very powerful movement for example it's already affecting the olympics yeah. uh you have you know you have people athletes in in the united states for example women athletes it set back the feminist movement too you had feminists who were making gains and then all of a sudden they have to compete against um so called women you know people who were born men but went through the they just declare themselves women you know they may they may have had some sort of chemical changes to their bodies but basically they're still men and they're now they're winning out in all the the competitions so sooner or later and i think it's already going to happen probably this this uh, in these olympics in japan you're going if it even takes place you're going to have um these transgender athletes taking taking or participating in these events So you have things like this that are happening and slowly creeping eastward and I I feel that that's a very big threat and it's it's also it's it's disturbing to a lot of westerners as well. Uh thank you so much for your nice explanation. Uh you know many international experts and activists believe that the transfer of global wealth and economic power from the west to east is underway. Do you agree with it? Uh yeah I'd have to say that it's it's definitely it's it's definitely looking that way that uh you know I think that's why for example you see the sanctions that have been placed on on Iran for example you see the the just yesterday I read an article that uh the uh what's it called the Gulf uh, stream the gas pipeline that's supposed to connect Russia with parts of Europe um yeah they uh the united states just basically said that if the countries go ahead and they continue cooperating with russia on this that they're going to you know slap sanctions against them so here you have an example of uh, the united states not being able to compete economically so they have to basically throw a tantrum like a child and throw these these sanctions against countries and people and individuals uh so you see a lot of unfair and they, uh, the reason for that is is that they just understand that the scales are starting to tip against them um and you have a powerhouse like China and there's their silk road and you know while the United States was making war in the Middle East although that is that is slowed down under Trump which is one of the one reasons that I I happen to think this is just a side note um I know that Trump he has a lot of problems and i don't like most of the things that he's done internationally 
But uh, the one thing I can say is at least he, and perhaps I don't know how, how he's viewed in your part of the world, I can imagine, though, but he at least, I think, had Hillary Clinton been elected, we would probably be in third world war right now, probably knee deep in it. So that's one positive, and anyway, that's a side note to the whole thing, but you see that the, the steps that they're taking against China, they are very worried about that. They just put sanctions against their um, telephone company away. Uh, so, yeah, they, they, they see, and China is just making such, such strong gains. So while the United States was making war in the Middle East, China and other countries in the East were trying to develop their economies. Iran was doing that. Russia was doing that. China was doing that. But the United States was so obsessed with war. And I think that may have even set them back. And they understand that now. So the only options they have right now is to slap these sanctions against a diversity, a diverse uh, array of countries right now. I see. Uh, and in this case, one of the uh, significant uh, tips is a, a relationship between China and uh, the U.S. actually. One of the most intricate uh, U.S. relations among the countries of the world is the relationship with China actually. However, the United States and China are potential enemies are also strategic partners. How far do you think the relationship between the two countries will go? Uh, I think that really depends a lot on what's going to happen in November with Donald Trump and his uh, chances of winning against Joe Biden. And I think China very much wants to see him lose, <laughs> um, as well as many other countries, I would imagine. Um, yeah, so he, they, they had a good, uh, China had a very good relationship with the Democrats. Things were moving along. Uh, you could make the argument, though, that the American workers were really suffering. But uh, as far as the corporations, American corporations were going, they were making tons of money. So you had people at the top who were very happy with the relationship, and they would, they would like to continue that relationship, that sort of economic partnership that was, that was really bringing a lot of money. So now things are very much um, in flux. Nobody really understands what's going to happen. There's just constant tension between the United States and China. They don't really know where that's going to go. Um, you also have a tremendous amount of Chinese investment in the United States. Uh, you still have lots of American products being produced in China. So you have this, this relationship where it's very difficult. It would be disastrous if it really completely fell apart. It would just, it would really bring down the, uh, the whole world economy. So it's a very fragile thing. And, uh, so I think it's going to really depend upon what happens in November. I think if, if things, if things go Trump's way in November, then, uh, you, you're going to see a lot of changes and, and the whole, it, I, I hope it doesn't even lead to war because the, the tensions right now between, yeah, between the United States and China are very high. And a lot of it is due to the economy. The United States sees that China is such a strong competitor and they are really trying to keep it in place. You know, they're, they've got their, military assets now in the South China Sea, and they're putting constant pressure on, on Beijing, trying to keep Taiwan in, in Hong Kong, keeping those tensions between the mainland China and those, those entities as high as possible. How things are going to go, uh, it's, it's just like I said, Fraud, it's, it's really going to depend upon what happens in November. Things are, are strenuous and there's lots of tension right now. Um, and I think right now there is, everything is kind of in a, um, people are just kind of sitting back and waiting to see what happens in November. I think everything is kind of in a, a holding pattern. Nobody really wants to do anything. Everybody's just kind of holding their breath and waiting for November. I, you know, people in China, the Americans, everything, it's this whole, this, that, that, that really believe that the elections, the American elections really explain a lot of the problems that we see in the world right now. It's slightly a different different topic, but a lot of it hinges upon upon the election. So Chinese, I think, are just sitting back and waiting to see what happens and praying that Trump is defeated. Great, great. Thank you so much. Another mm -hmm. matter is about the uh, oil, actually, industry of the United States. 
Uh, actually, one way that the United States has uh, communicated with other countries has been through oil exports. Uh, what has happened to the U.S. oil industry, actually? Could you please open it up for us? Um, well, you have a lot of lot of competition right now. Um, it's not really my specialty, for that, that particular discussion about the oil. I'm not really um, terribly knowledgeable about that, I have to admit. Um, if you want to speak perhaps about the gas industry, uh, you know, you could say that that's another point. The United States just wants to take more and more of the market as much as it can. It wants to start exporting its uh, resources to Europe, for example. It wants to block Russia. So I, I can't really speak too much, though, on, on, this, on the oil uh, situation, the oil markets. Uh, that's not really my specialty, unfortunately. Okay, it doesn't matter. Let's jump to another matter that uh, the American people are uh, facing with. It is about the oppression and injustice and systematic racism, gross violations, and uh, actually the domination of the rich class on 99% of American society, violent and racist behavior of the U.S. police, and uh, the position of the U.S. president. All, all of them are the main reasons for the public anger and the civil protests these days. Uh, these are actually uh, the atrocities that have taken place in the United States over the years. But now the American people are revolting against their oppressive rulers at this time. What impact has this situation had on the course of U.S. interactions with other countries? What do you think? Well, I think, uh, first of all, as, as uh, an American living here in Russia, I'm very concerned myself, for example, about the state of the economy, the dollar, what's going to happen to that. So much of the world hinges upon that. Um, if, if things continue the way they are, and it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon, um, then, yeah, that, that could really affect investment in the United States. People are just going to start losing faith. And that's what the economy is completely based upon, of course, is the confidence that people have in a country. So if they see these riots and protests continuing, um, then you're going to have a situation where the, the investment climate just dries up. As far as the situation in the United States goes, um, you know, they talk a lot about the racism. I, I think that might that is more symptomatic of um, our media really manipulating the situation. I think we do have a, a there are pockets of racism. I don't know if you want to touch upon this subject or not. I think it might be interesting, though, for your listeners, that this really shows the power of the Western media to influence opinion. And they've done it against your country. They've done it against Russia. I've seen them doing it against China. And now they're doing it in, in the country itself. And this has never been greater than with Trump in office. It's so obvious now that the mainstream media is so biased and so able, so powerful. They're so powerful to be able to just manipulate opinion the way they are. And I lived in the United States until I was until about 15 years ago. And I worked in a major corporation, and there, it was a diverse workplace. And we had blacks working together with whites, and there was very little racism. Everybody got along. Um, you know, so this whole this whole notion that America is a this boiling pot of racism, it's, uh, it's really been exaggerated. And I, I think a big part of that, again, goes back to the fact that you do have these elections coming up. And this is just another, another thing that the Democrats have thrown at Donald Trump, um, trying to make, trying to just, just, I mean, literally destroy the country, trying to destroy the global economy, uh, trying to destroy the American economy, trying to uh, inflame tensions between the blacks and the whites. And I really think that if people would just turn off their televisions, I think that this whole question of racism would really not exist. So that's just one, one aspect of it. You talked about the oppression of, of the American people. Yeah, I, d I definitely agree with that. There are, it's one thing that's very surprising, I think, to a lot of people when you visit. I don't know if you've been to America, but there are beautiful parts of the United States and there are other parts that you literally can't walk through. Um, they're so bad. They're so. It's really incredible, actually. They're, they're, the 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 level of poverty. I live here in Russia, and growing up, um, 
we were always told that Russia was a very poor place and and it's it's really changed. And to tell you the truth, I've 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 lived here for a long time, for over a decade, and I've never walked through a, a neighborhood in Russia where I, I really feared for my life, like I like I did when I walked through my own hometown, for example, in in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so you, you do you have these pockets of severe poverty in the United States and crime, and that that situation is very dangerous. And I think it's it's getting much worse. And like, for example, with this whole COVID-19, the coronavirus, they said that I forget how much of the wealth transferred to the top, like 1% of the the uh, owners and the CEOs and the corporations, but people like um, the Amazon owner, uh, Bill Gates, all these people, they've just witnessed a tremendous amount of, of profit taking. Literally, I think, um, Funny, I can't think of his name right now. The head, the, who's the CEO of Amazon? <laughs> you know who I mean. But he just made like five billion dollars in one day. So it's just, it's just amazing. So you have these people, and you have a situation now where people are locked up at home. They're losing their jobs. Jo uh, small businesses are going out, uh, and all you know. So how that's going to work out down the road, I really don't know. I don't know how that that situation is going to turn out in the end, but. I think it's very dangerous, dangerous mostly, I think, for the United States. I don't I don't really see how the country, this is being very pessimistic, but I really, and I've talked to my, my American friends here as well, and they say the same thing, that we don't understand how the country is going to survive after November because it's just been split and it's so divisive between the Democrats and the Republicans that yeah. no matter who wins, if the Republicans win, the Democrats are just going to, they're going to take to the streets and the same thing will happen vice versa. So. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens, and I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm glad that I'm, I'm far away from that situation. I don't want to be there right now. <laughs> okay, okay, great. And for the last question, how do you predict the future of the U.S. generally? Ah, uh, wow. Well, I, I, I'm very, to, to be honest, I, I hate to say this because I do love my country, but I, I like everybody, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for my country. I want to see it do well. But uh, unfortunately, um, myself and many other Americans who I speak to here, we all we all really feel the same way that it's just it's really heading on a, a very bad path right now. And if things don't if things don't turn around, if they don't find a way to, to try to, to to get this divide between the Democrats and the Republicans, between the conservatives and the liberals, if they don't find a way to solve that, I, I really don't see how we're going to have much of a future. Um, they talked about diversity being such a golden thing and such a wonderful thing. And, you know, it's it's engraved on our Statue of Liberty that people of all nations should be able to get together and, and uh, do well. And we, we tried that experiment. And it, right now it looks like, unfortunately, that multiculturalism is really failing, at least in the United States. It's working perhaps in other countries, but in the United States uh, there are particular Forces, I suppose you could say, who have taken advantage of, of the fragility that does exist when you have different communities of people trying to live together. It's very easy to manipulate that situation, and I think that's what's happening. You don't have such a situation, and I keep pointing to Russia uh, as my example, but that's my the best parallel that I can make, the best analogy. I see that the Russian people, they've managed to keep things somewhat homogenous. There is a lots of uh, multiculturalism here. Surprisingly, people don't understand that, but there is a high degree of it. But yet they've still managed somehow to keep the Russian language alive. Uh, and I mean, of course, you have you do have problems once in a while, but not to the extent, for example, that you have in the United States. So I don't know, perhaps uh, it will, the United States will survive. It's just going to have to pass through, I believe, a, a period of great pain in order to find a way whether that might be a second civil war, which unfortunately I, I do I do think that's what's on the horizon for the United States, perhaps as early as November. Um, so that yeah, it just a lot of it depends on how they're able to get together the the conservatives and the liberals. And I personally, see, huh? yeah, yeah, personally I don't see how it it can actually because the differences. I mean, you get on for example, you get onto Twitter. 
And there you have like a microcosm of the situation in the United States. You could just see there's just, you know, people block each other, people cancel each other. So you have like this one camp of conservatives, you have the other camp of liberals. And these two groups just can, cannot see eye to eye. It's And I, I really, I just don't see how we're ever as a country going to be able to get over that. And so it's it's a it's a big problem. Okay, if you would like to add something more, I am all ears. Uh, well, I just I'd like to just thank you for having me on your program. Uh, okay. So it's a great honor for me, and uh, it's very interesting for me to see how the I I really hope that the relations between the United States and Iran are able to improve. I've heard a lot about your country, for example. It's it's a place that I would love to see one day. I've heard many great things about God it. Willing. God willing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us again, and I do appreciate you to your notes for your remarks, and I hope things are going well with you and your work also. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Father. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Dear audience, thanks for watching another episode of the Fact Series, which was a talk with Robert Bridge, an American journalist and author, on diminishing the role of the United States in the international arena. Take care of yourself and catch you later.